Let's, uh, let's get serious for a second here. Um, if you've got a Bible there, turn to James chapter 4 for me this morning. Turn to James chapter 4. We're going to have a little bit of a look at a couple of things, continue a journey we've been on. Um, I came across this story the other day. There was a preacher, and they had a, a five-year-old daughter. And, and before every time he preached, he would stop and bow his head just in silence. And then after 30 seconds or so, he'd lift his head and he'd begin to preach. And so one day his daughter, five-year-old daughter, she said, Daddy, when you get up to preach, why is it that you, you stop? You sort of bow your head for about 30 seconds, then you lift and then you preach. What are you actually doing when you bow your head? So he was really chuffed that his daughter was so observant and had noticed that he was doing this. And so he says this, or he says, well, honey, um, I'm asking the Lord to help me to preach a really good sermon. So she turns around and says, well, then how come he doesn't do it? Now, having said that, let's bow our heads. I want to pray. Father, I just pray right now, Lord, would you open our ears to hear what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us, God. Open our eyes to see some things. And Father, most of all, would you continue to conform each of us, God? We're all on a journey. God, we're all getting to know you, Father. And would you continue to take each of us another step today on that journey of discovery, God? Discovering who you are, Father, who we are, and what you have for us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. We've been talking about prayer for the last X amount of weeks, and we're going to continue to talk about prayer for the next X amount of weeks. Who knows? We'll keep talking about prayer till one Sunday you rock up and we're not talking about prayer. I don't want to put a number on it. But we've been talking about prayer and looking at different aspects of prayer. And uh, we talked about the focus of prayer. We've gone back and looked at the Lord's Prayer. We talked about the focus of prayer being the face of God when Jesus taught his disciples to pray. The very first thing he said was, Our Father in heaven, let's, let's realize who we're praying to. Let's realize what our focus needs to be when we come to God in prayer. We're looking to a Father. And then he goes on and he prayed, uh, uh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the focus of prayer is the face of God, but the object of prayer is the will of God. Prayer is not just uh, an opportunity for us to hand God a shopping list and go, here's what you have to do for me. Uh, As we mature and grow in our faith, we realize that prayer is an opportunity for us to co-work with God, co-create with God in order to bring about his will down here on earth. Jesus said the first thing you've got to do before you even begin to talk about my daily bread and, and leading, not leading me, before all that, he said, let's get our focus right on God and let's understand that what we're about to present to God ultimately is we want his will. Amen. We want the will of God to come to pass down here on earth. We want the will of God in our nation. We want the will of God in our community. We want the will of God in our families. We want the will of God in our own lives. And if you're anything like me, sometimes my desires and my will and what I think is right, it conflicts a little bit every now and then with God's. But I want to be humble enough and open enough to be able to say to God, if there's a conflict between your will and my will, I want to be the kind of person, God, where your will wins out. There's nothing wrong with having a will, nothing wrong with being honest and telling God what we want or or what we would like out of a situation or how we're feeling. That's healthy and a part of prayer. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we want to be able to submit ourselves in our prayer life to God and realize that prayer is a means by which Jesus said it's really about bringing the will of God down here to earth and co-creating and working with God. So we've been looking at different aspects of prayer And one of the statements that I made last week when we talked about your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is this, that if we're not the kinds of people who are committed to accepting the will of God, then we'll never really be the type of people who are committed to praying for the will of God. If we're not prepared to accept the will of God for our life, then it's going to be very, very hard for us with integrity to pray for the will of God. There's going to be this constant tension that exists, this constant clashing between what I want and what deep down inside I come to learn and realize that God actually wants for me. And so I want to take that thought one step further today. In James chapter 4, verse 1 to 5, um, if you go back to Acts chapter 7, there's a really uh, significant uh, incident takes place in the life of the early church. The book of Acts is basically the first 30 years of, of, of church history. This is what happened, how this movement we're a part of today began, and, and it covers about the first 30 years. And there's a significant moment in Acts 7 where a, a gentleman by the name of Stephen is martyred for his faith. Stephen's killed for his faith. 
And just after Stephen's killed for his faith in Acts chapter 7, a big persecution broke out in Jerusalem uh, towards the church, or what we used to be known as the way, this movement called the way. And it says in Acts chapter 8 that, that those that were persecuted, the church that was in Jerusalem, it says that they scattered, and it says they took off everywhere. And I think it's in verse 4, it says that, and the people that scattered, everywhere they went, it says they preached Jesus everywhere they went. Everywhere they went, they preached Christ. Now, that, that's an amazing group of people, isn't it? I want you to imagine, let's make it 2021 here in Lismore. All of a sudden, something happens and the authorities just go completely off the church and decide, not only do we not agree with you, but now we're going to come down hard on you. We're going to, we're going to go door to door. We're going to find you. We're going to throw you in prisons. We're going to take away your businesses. We're going to take away your livelihoods. We're going to make sure that you no longer exist in society. You cannot function. Now, I want you to imagine being in that position, being in that place. And then the only way that you know you're going to survive is you just decide to hightail it out of here. You don't have time to go and pack a bag. I'm sorry, darling, but you don't have time to pack a bag if this happens, all right? So so you don't have time to go and pack a bag. You don't have time to go and say goodbye to all your friends. You don't have time to enroll your children in school in that other place that you're going to uh, because there's a big waiting list and you didn't know. You don't have time. You've just got to basically up with the shirt on your back and just take off and leave. What would you be thinking in that moment? If that was you, what would you be thinking? Well, these guys, we don't know everything about what they're thinking, but they were thinking enough about God that it says when they got to their destinations, they just went and preached Christ everywhere. They preached Jesus everywhere. I mean, I read that and I go, that is such a, that is such a commitment to you, Father. That is such a committed group of people. <laughs> would I do that? Would that be the first thing? Or would I run to the next town and go, you know what, I'm going to tone this Jesus thing down a little bit because look what it cost me last time. I'm just going to bring it back a little bit. Just, just rein it in a little bit because I know what happened. If I get too far out there, what happens if they find me? What if it happens if this hatred for the church expands beyond Jerusalem? What happens if they come for me? I'm just going to maybe go a bit underground here because it's going to cost me too much. But they didn't do that. It says everywhere they went, they just preached Jesus. Hey, let me tell you about a message that got me run out of my last town. Let me tell you about a message that got my business taken from me. Let me tell you about a message that caused my good mate Stephen to get stoned to death. Let me tell you about it. Because the message is so real. And the call to follow that message is so real. And I'm so focused on it and so committed to it that it takes more than the death of my mate Stephen. It takes more than the loss of my business. It's going to take more than the hatred of the government. It's going to take more than the persecution and the pressure for me to tone it down a little bit for that message. Isn't that amazing, amazing faith? We we, we don't sort of, I guess, see this too much in the Western world too much today, but you go to certain other nations. We spent some time in India, and it's it's amazing. We would go to villages, and people would give their life to Jesus. And the consequence for them could be that, okay, I can't actually go to the community well now and get water with everybody else. If I accept Jesus, I know what happens. I've got to walk five kilometers to another well somewhere to get water because I can no longer use that well because I'm no longer a Hindu or a Muslim or whatever they were. So I'm, I'm, I'm gone. I can't go to that patch in the river and wash my clothes with the other ladies now because of my faith in Jesus. Because I decided to believe in Jesus. I decided to accept the truth, the reality of the fact that there is a God out there that created us, that loves us, that has a plan for us. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. So that at the end of my life, I can stand before him. And he can fling open them gates of heaven and say, enter in, well done good and faithful servant, not because I'm perfect, not because I nailed everything, not because I I, I suddenly found the religious book and I dotted every I and I crossed every T and now I know the the, the moral way of life and I'm doing it all. No, no, because I accepted that what Jesus went through on the cross was payment for what I did. And I chose to live my life for him. Amazing bunch of people. Well, you know that group of people I just spoke to you about? Well, that's the group of people that James is writing to. James is writing... The book of James is one of the earliest uh, uh, manuscripts discovered in the New Testament. It's one of the earliest New Testament writings historically. And and most theologians believe that it was written, James was writing, to this group of believers that had scattered and taken off. 
And we get here to James chapter 4, and we've got a, a bit of a different picture, don't we, of, of, of this. In, in Acts chapter 8, these are guys that nothing's going to shut us up. We are so committed to Jesus. But then by the time James writes this letter to them, they sound like there's been a few things that have kind of changed. They've probably toned things down just a little bit. And here's what he says. He says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Now, you could stop me right there, as if there would be wars and fights in a church. Come on. Seriously. Have you ever been to a church where there's been infighting and wars? And Come on, that doesn't exist, surely. Eh? Well, here it was 2,000 years ago. They've still got the same stuff going on. You know why? Because humans are involved. I heard somebody say once um, that, that, that they were looking for a perfect church. They said, well, if you find the perfect church, don't go there because you'll ruin it. You'll ruin it. If it was perfect without you, leave it alone. Don't mess it up. Don't take the chance. Love everybody else and stay away because you'll screw it up. Where do walls and fights come from among you? He says, do they not come from your desires for pleasure? That war in your members. You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself, let's say makes himself, makes himself. Don't say God, he makes himself. The choice that he made, this choice is outworking something where he's turning himself, he's making himself into what James writes as an enemy of God, has enmity with God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain? Think about this. This is God to you. The spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. God in you yearns jealously for your affections. The spirit in you yearns jealously for your devotion. The spirit in you yearns jealously for your commitment. The spirit in you yearns jealously for your fellowship. The spirit of God inside of you uh, yearns jealously for you as the bride does for, sorry, the bridegroom does for the bride. That affection, that sense of passion, that desire to have your affection, that desire to be with you and to do life with you. What's happened? I mean, one minute, these guys, death and the loss of every material thing can't shake their faith and their sole focus and commitment on God. And yet, by the time James writes to them here, he says, you know what? Once upon a time, you were living for the desires of God and the passions of God, and that's why you were prepared to run. That's why you were prepared to continue to put yourself out there, preach about Jesus, let people know, hey, I'm a Christ follower. It doesn't matter whether I'm in Jerusalem or Samaria. I don't care where I am. I am a Christ follower, and I'm going to let everybody know. Instead of now chasing after that, now he says that, you know where these fights and bickering is coming from? You're fighting for your own desires now. Everybody's got their own desires, their own will, their own purpose, their own plan. Something's happened where these guys have got a little bit distracted from the sole focus of of the will of God, the purposes of God, the plan of God. Something's happened where instead of being a group of people that were just running hard after Jesus and bringing his kingdom to earth, now you're a bunch of people that are infighting and bickering and you all want your own way. Something's happened along the way. Something distracted them. Something's pulled their focus and their attention away. How many of you know distraction can be really, really dangerous, can't it? If you're driving down the road, you don't want to be distracted while you're driving down the road in a car. You don't want to be distracted. I've got a friend of mine, he was cutting a piece of wood on a bandsaw and he got distracted. He's now got four and a half fingers on one hand because he got distracted. Hey, what was that? That didn't sound like wood. It wasn't. We picked it up. I remember we put it in a little bag. I was working with YWAM at the time and took him to the hospital. I got distracted just the other day. Can you tell? <laughs> I went to the hairdressers. I'm sitting there in the chair and, and uh, I, he's got an apprentice there. And so the apprentice is there and he didn't kind of speak really fluent English. But the apprentice is there. I sit in the chair and the apprentice gets in front and he starts doing the clipper thing with me, you know. And they always ask me this question. Every time I go to a hairdresser, they, just, they say, so what do you want me to do? What, what, what type of haircut do you want? And my reply is the same. Look, I made, uh, uh, it's not a mistake. But, but in this situation, I made the mistake of 26 years ago marrying a hairdresser. 
So I don't, I've never, I don't go to a barber or a hairdresser and, and, and tell them what I want. I sit there and take what I'm given. <laughs> so don't ask me, what do I want? I just want whatever my wife would give me. And you better get it right or I'll be coming back. As I sat there and he starts clipping away. And so, but my friend, the guy that owns a business, he's over on this other chair and he's cutting another guy's hair. And so he starts talking to me. So he's cutting this guy's hair, but he's looking in the mirror at me. So I'm sitting here and the whole time I'm looking over there having this conversation. And 20 minutes later, I turn back and look at the mirror in front of me. He went, oh, is he not going to be happy? He'd done all this stuff, you know, he, had, he hadn't touched a single piece of hair on that strip in the middle of my head. I look like the you know, 14 year old kids with the. That's what I look like. I'm sitting there going, I can't go home like this. I can't do it. You've got to do something. And so my mate, the hairdresser, came over and took control and got in front of me and cut, cut, cut. But distractions. If you were more regular, I'd have a comeback, but I'm glad you're visiting us today. So James gets into this group of people, doesn't he? You read this, James just gets into this group of people. I mean, who wants to go to James's church, by the way? Do you, who wants to go to that church? I mean, he doesn't pull any punches, you know? You adulterers and adulteresses. You're friends with the world. I mean, nobody wants to be there. You're not going to stay in that church, are you? You're going to leave. We're going to go somewhere else. That's not nice. James didn't, hasn't, obviously hasn't read that pastor's book that says pastors need to be nice. If you've got people coming, be nice to them. Tell them some nice things. You want them to stay. It's like when Jesus, remember when Jesus had the crowds coming and he said to them, yeah, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're not worthy to be my disciple. Do you remember that? And it says that they said, oh, scratch their temples, their Solomon's temple. And they went, this is a bit tough. We don't need any of this. And it says that they all took off. And then Jesus ran after him and said, no, no, I didn't mean that. Come back. I didn't mean that. No, you misinterpreted me. No, he didn't do that. He just let him walk. In fact, he turned to the 12 and said, you guys want to go too? Don't let that all hit you on the way out. <laughs> he set the agenda. They didn't. I don't decide what commitment to God looks like. God decided that. I don't decide what a, the prerequisite is for being born again. God decided all that sort of stuff. You know? I, don't, I don't like it. I'll be brutally honest with you and say I don't like a lot of it, you know. But I'm smart enough to realise I'm not God. And I've got a funny feeling he knows a couple of things more than me. Just a thought. He knows a few things more than me. So, so James is, is really giving it to them here. And somewhere along the lines, they've gone from being in this really, really committed group to this group that got somewhat distracted and have kind of drop the ball in terms of their commitment and their faith to God. And, and, and James goes on and he says this, and this is where I want to sort of tie in again the will of God and prayer. These guys got so distracted from the purposes of God and the call of God that not only did they get distracted from God and begin to start obsessing about their own will, their own desires and what they wanted, not only were they so committed to their own desires that they were prepared to do anything to get there. It didn't matter who they walked on. He says, you covet, you fight, you'll kill. You'll do anything to get your will. You'll do anything to have your desire come to pass and to achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. You'd, once upon a time, you did anything for the agenda of Christ. Anything. Now, now you're kind of doing anything just to get your own way. And then he goes on and he brings prayer into it. He says, you don't have because you don't ask. But it's interesting. Then he says, and when you do ask, though, you're asking with the wrong motivation, so you're not getting what you're asking for anyway. Because you're asking amiss that you might spend it all on yourselves, on your own pleasures again. Your prayer life is now being consumed again with your own will, what you want. I wonder whether, when he said, you, you, you don't have because you don't ask. Anybody ever wanted something of somebody, but you knew that you shouldn't want it? But you really wanted it, but you knew you shouldn't. So you're hesitant to go and ask for it because you know the answer is going to be no, because you know... You're smart enough. It's like children. Children are like that, aren't they? They know that they shouldn't be asking this because they know the answer is going to be no, and they know that the no is probably the right answer. They shouldn't be having it, but they, but they want to come and ask, but then they hold back and don't ask because they know the answer is going to be no. And so because their will is not in alignment with their parents, it kind of alienates them from their parents a little bit, doesn't it? It, it alienates you a little bit. 
And I wonder whether this is what's going on here with these guys is because they're fighting about their own will now and their own will at any price, it didn't matter. No longer was God's will the centre of their world. No wonder was God's will their main focus, whether that, that chasing of their own desires and their own will was it something that was beginning to alienate them just a little bit from God. We, we don't want to go and ask God. Partly because we know that what we're fighting for, we know that what we want, we know that it's probably not his highest, it's not what he wants. And so they're alienating themselves a little bit from God. See, the truth is we'll never be a people who truly pray God's will if we're not a people who are prepared to accept God's will. It's just a fact of life. And then he kind of sums it up, I guess, and gets to the meat of the real issue. Here's why you're chasing after your own will all of a sudden. Here's why you'll do whatever it takes to get what you want. Here's why you don't pray. And here's why when you do pray, your motivations are all skew if. He says, don't you know friendship with the world is enmity with God? Friendship with the world is enmity with God. What that literally means is this. Well, by the way, that word world in the New Testament, it's the, it's, it's the Greek word cosmos. You know, in English we have, our language is like English food. It's just bland, you know? One word and... That's meant to, a lot of other cultures have various different words that express different things. You know, we're pretty boring language, to be honest with you. Uh, but in the, in the Greek, there are various words for world. But this word cosmos, it, it's, it's interpreted in, in different ways, three different ways in particular. But the particular way that James is using it is it's speaking about the world as in the, the, the systems and the values and the ethics and the way that those that are alienated from God, those that don't know God, do life. And that's the context that, James is using here when he talks about world. It's the ungodly system of human life as it is lived in separation from God. The ungodly way of life as it is lived in separation from God. So now we've got these people here and he's saying, you, you, you're fighting for your own will. All of a sudden your own will has taken precedence in your life. You'll do whatever it takes to get that. You know something's not right, so you don't want to bring it to me in prayer anymore. So that chasing of your own will is alienating you from the life of God. And when you do come, you know that you're coming with wrong motivations and so on. So it's impacting your prayer life. It's deadening your spirituality. It's killing your spiritual passion and your spiritual fervor. And he goes on and he says, because even though you say you're Christian, you're living as if you are alienated from God. You're living as if you didn't have a relationship with God, yet you're Christian. And why are you doing that? Because you're really desiring friendship with the world. You're craving friendship with the world. You know, this, if you go back through the Old Testament, you'll see that this has been a problem for God's people for a long, long time. A long, long time. Craving and desiring friendship with the world. We, we still want to be cool, don't we? We just still want to be cool, you know? I mean, I want Jesus. I want you to know that I follow Jesus, but man, I'm just like you. But I follow Jesus. But I'm just like you, man. I still live the same lifestyle and I still, but I've just got my little Jesus thing that I tack on there. And because I've got Jesus tacked on, it makes everything all right. And, and, and if I just live like everyone else and I look cool like everyone else, well, maybe that'll make, them, that, that'll make Jesus more attractive and they'll want to come to faith in Jesus because I do what you all do as well. It's just like tack the Jesus badge on. And I'll just hang out with you and you'll see the Jesus badge one day. It'll be the Jesus badge. It'll make you want to come and join my group. Once upon a time, the church was this countercultural uh, op uh, option for the world. Hey, hey, the Jesus people are a bit different. Not weird different. You know, I'm not talking religious weird different with you know, self-flagellation and, and, and all the weird religious stuff that we've done over the years to prove we're not friends with the world and we really love God. Let's do all these weird things. It's, it's, it, it's not about that. But it's about realizing that they're once upon a time was a definite separation between the way that the world operated, the values, the ethics, the systems, the structures, the way people lived alienated, separated from God, and the way that a person lived when they came to faith in God. And they connected themselves to God. So friendship with the world means having a connection so strong to the world that the world has your heart, your will, and your affections more than God does. More than God does. Think about that for a second. Friendship with the world means having a connection so strong to the world that it has your heart, your will, and your affections more, more than God does. It's one of the things about friendship, isn't it? When you've got friends, 
someone who's a genuine friend, you, you really want to please those friends, don't you? That's, what, that's, that's one of the beauties of friendship. You want to do things that build into that friendship, that deepen that relationship, that make that bond stronger. That's what we do with friends. But friendship with the world is when we're trying to deepen that bond, that connection with the system and a way of doing life that's basically the way that people that don't have life in God, don't have hope in God, don't understand that God is with them all the time. God is involved in their conversations. He's involved in your business deals. God's involved with the way you treat your wife, the way you treat your children. God's involved with what you're watching on TV. God's involved with what you're looking at on the computer at two o'clock in the morning when nobody's around. God's involved in all that stuff. The presence of God is there. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Let me, let me give you a really, really practical picture of, 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 of what happens. Uh, go with me to 1 Samuel. In, in 1 Samuel, we've got the story of Israel asking God for a king. Everyone remember that story? We want a king. Right? It's really interesting because I was thinking about this the other day, that if you go back and you read the book of Judges, right? the book of Judges is a washing machine. Right? It's a washing machine. It's just a cycle. We love God. God's with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're the Jesus people. <laughs> Then all of a sudden they get in, oh, we marry foreign wives or we like this foreign god or we like that bit of the culture. And so we allow that bit of culture to come into Israel. Then before you know it, they reject God. God takes his hand off and goes, right, you want to do it without me? Go, you harness. An army comes in, invades them, takes them over. Then they start to go back down. They hit the bottom. They go, oh, God, we're so sorry. Would you help us? God raises up a judge. The judge comes, leads them into victory. They go, hallelujah, we're the Jesus people again. Oh, look at that. Isn't that pretty over there? Wouldn't mind a little bit of that. Wouldn't mind a little bit of that. Before you know it, God's left them. They're back at the bottom again. They're being oppressed by somebody else. Oh, God, we're so sorry. We're so sorry. Help us. God raises up a judge, a leader. They go, oh, look at us. We're the Jesus people again. Oh, gee, that's really pretty over there. I'd love to go and play in that pond for a bit. Go for it. And it just goes, bloop, 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 bloop. That's what the book of Judges is. It's just this cyclic book of what happens when you turn away from God and God goes, right, yeah, you want to do it without me? Go your hardest. But then when you cry out to God and he comes back in and then you live with God and you prosper and then you turn away from God and go, don't need you anymore. That's really pretty. It's just this cycle. Well, listen to what's happening here. Um, it says in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4 and 5. All the elders of Israel gathered together and they came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, look, you are old. Who wants to be told that? I just, you know, in 2020, what are we this year? 20 what? 20, 21. I knew that, just well done. You got it right. In 2021, in 2021, I came to Theo and said, Theo, you're old. <laughs> That's what would happen. You can't do that anymore. We're so sensitive and politically correct. All the elders of Israel gathered together. They came to Samuel at Ramah and they said to him, Look, you are old. I just want to stress that again. You are old. And your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Samuel goes back to God and says, God, guess what? They want to... Now my first thought was, hang on a second. You want a king to lead you like the other nations. They wanted a military leader, somebody to take up arms. Go back to the book of Judges. What do you think you got time after time after time after time after time? Basically a king. We called him a judge. He was basically a king. He took up arms. God used him to defeat the enemies. They were set free. It's kind of the same thing. I'm thinking, well, hang on a second, you're asking for a king, but what a king is going to do, you've kind of had that coming through in a, in a, in a, in a different form. What's going on here? And then in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 8, fast forward to verse 19 and 20, uh, Samuel goes to God and God goes, you know what, just, okay, that's what they want. So Samuel comes back and goes, right here, here's the deal. If you get a king, this is what it's going to be like. It's going to suck. He's going to do this to you and that to you. And, and he just outlines this horrible existence that they're about to walk into if they persist this idea of a king. And here's what they said in verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And it suddenly dawned on me. It wasn't a king that they were after. You know what they were after? They wanted to look like all the other nations. It wasn't the king. They'd already had an experience of a king-type person. And as a matter of fact, go back a, a, a little bit before this, and Samuel's a judge, and Samuel fights for them. So they've got a leader who's standing up like a military leader. God's giving them that for, for, for years. But the key here is not give us a king. It's give us a king like all the other nations. 
We want a king like all the other nations. In other words, we want friendship with the world out there. We want you, God, but we just want to look like the cool kids in school as well. So we want you, God. We know we need you, but we just we want to look like everybody else as well. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. What that literally means in the Greek is not that if you are a friend of, of the world, that God goes, you're now my enemy. What it literally means is this, that if you pursue friendship with the world, you pursue the world's way of doing things and so on, what you are doing is you're turning yourself into a person that's actually fighting against what God wants. You're actually, what you're doing with your life is not bringing the will of God to earth anymore. You're not strengthening the kingdom of God down here. You're actually turning yourself into somebody that is helping support the wrong kingdom. That's what it means. And way back then, Israel wanted to look like the world around them. And isn't that, can't we see so many parallels to that today? I mean, I've got to be honest, even as a pastor, I see so many parallels to that in the modern Western church. And I I, I know people feel like I pick on the Western church. I don't mean to. But how, how often are we dependent upon just trying to look cool so that everybody will come? The problem is if you look cool and that's why people come, you better stay cool, otherwise the people will leave. I love what Paul said in in, in Corinthians. He said, when I came preaching, I didn't come with wise and persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of man, but on the power of God. So that your faith would be in God, the eternal God, the living spirit that's here, present in this place right now that you're going to take with you when you leave. That can transform and change you. Way better than a light show and a fancy message and some great guitar riffs in worship, and a beautiful program here. It's it's God. It's God that we need. It's God that transforms. It's God that changes us. It's God. Look at God's response to Israel when Israel said, we want a king. Here's God's response in verse 7. The Lord said this to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, they've rejected me. Think about that. We want to be cool. We want, to, we want to be friends with the world. And God says, that's okay. You could choose it, but you need to understand something. If you choose friendship with the world, what you're really saying is that you're rejecting me. That's frightening, isn't it? You know, people talk about what's it going to cost me to really live for God. There's a price to pay to follow Jesus. If I go hard after, later, you know, take up your cross daily, follow me. And we talk about the, the price of, of, of following Jesus. And yep, there is a cost involved. But as I've said many times, don't ever uh, allow any demon from hell or any person to tell you the price you pay is greater than what you get back. Life in God is way better. Whatever God asks you to lay down or exchange or give to him, he always gives you back way better than you could possibly give him. That's the nature of your loving father. So people sit there and go, oh, I don't really want to surrender everything to him because I'm afraid what will it look like? What will he take away from me? Let me tell you something. When he gives into your life, what he places in your life, what he puts on your life, it will far outweigh anything you feel like you've given up. Far outweigh. But it takes that step of faith, doesn't it? It takes that step of commitment, that step of faith into that unknown before we begin to experience all that. God said to Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They've actually rejected me. They don't want me. They don't want to walk with me. They just want to be cool. Put their arms around the world and go, hey, we're not like those radical Christian people over there. You know, those, we're not like them. We're just like you. We're best buddies. We even think they're weird. We're with you. We can be best buddies. One best buddy, one best buddy, one best buddy. Anyone know that kid's cartoon show? One best buddy, one best buddy. Be best buddies of the world. And and, and James is saying to them, he's saying, in a friendship with God, if you desire friendship with God, uh, friendship with the world to that degree, that's what you're doing. You're going to alienate yourself from the true life of God. If you're more offended and hurt by the rejection of man than you are excited by the acceptance of God, then you'll never live for his will. You'll never accept his ways. You'll never reflect his goodness. And you'll never be that city on a hill that cannot be hidden. And I believe that each of you in this room, you want to be that city on a hill. We want that life of God. We want to reflect the will of God. Why does James believe these people are not seeing God come through in the way that he believes God wants to? 
It's because they're preferring friendship with the world over their friendship with God. And when the two cultures clash in their world, it's the world that wins. We need to be people that make our mind up that friendship with God is what matters the most. It's God that we're going to go after. See, I I, I radically believe with all my heart, all my heart, I believe that we've just been through the great big distraction of COVID and the disruption and people have got all kinds of names for it. But I, I honestly believe it's been a chance for the church, the people of God, to hit a reset button. They go, you know what? You know, once upon a time we had all the bells and the whistles and the stuff and all of a sudden we couldn't even meet in our own buildings. All of a sudden we, all of a sudden we were forced to meet in the place where statistically, you know, the hardest place for people to live out their faith is statistically? It's in their own home. You know, the easiest place for people to live out their faith statistically? Right here in the church with everybody putting your mask on. Hey, hallelujah, brother. Praise the Lord. Isn't that awesome? Take it off. If you can't take your mask off here, where can you take it off? By the way, I'm not talking COVID mask for the people on video. <laughs> I'm talking those masks that we sometimes put on when we get in around religious people because we, we've somehow bought into the lie that if, I, if I'm feeling sad or having a struggle or something, it's a reflection of my faith in God. No, it's not. It's just life. You're human and stuff happens, you know? Stuff happens. Okay, in closing, there are many who make the decision that the cost of friendship with God is simply too high. So they'll never be prepared to pay it. But I want to leave you with this thought. Have you ever thought about the cost of friendship with the world? According to James... You're just slowly chipping away, making yourself an enemy of God. We've got to choose whose affection we prefer. God can't do anything with half a person. But you give him a whole person, he can change the world. Amen? Father, I want to thank you for this morning, Lord. I want to thank you for your word. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, I believe you've been speaking to people. Lord, I pray, don't let anybody get up from this place now and just move on and just have coffee and just have a chat about the weather, and just go and have lunch, or whatever it is that we're doing. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, would you stir in people's hearts that which you're saying to them. God, I pray that uh, if there's anybody here this morning, that before you leave this place, you would, you would go and grab somebody and say, I want to tell you what the Holy Spirit has just said to me. I want to make myself accountable. I want to share something with you. I want to ask you to pray for me. Before we leave this place, would you pray for me? Would you grab somebody and say, could you pray for me this morning? Be the body to each other. So Holy Spirit, I just commit each person here to you. I pray, Father, as we leave this place, uh, God, in the next seven days, God, everybody in this room that knows you, that calls upon the name of Jesus, in the next seven days, would you give each one of us an opportunity to tell somebody out there about the goodness of God, somebody outside the walls of this building that does not know how good you are, doesn't know that you love them, doesn't know that you died for them. God, would you give us the opportunity this next seven days to tell somebody about the goodness of God. And Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. 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 Bless you guys. There is tea and coffee next door. But can I encourage you again? If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, don't just get up and run off. Feel free to sit there, have a bit of a think with God. Grab somebody. Say, hey, I just want to share with you. It's what I feel like God said to me. Or, or ask somebody to pray for you. Don't just get on as if what just happened is now over and we'll move on to the next chapter. Amen. <laughs>